Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. In the name of transparency and recognising my bias, I want to flag up right now at the very start that the early life of Queen Victoria makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me squeamish and also a little angry on her behalf. Of course, as always, I am going to be working to present as rounded an overview as I possibly can. But I do think that for me to do that, it's important that I let you know my personal feelings on this topic before we begin. Because knowing that, as I do, it is of course possible that during this video I may even overcorrect. So, with that disclaimer in mind, unsurprisingly, today we will be looking at the so-called Kensington system. This was supposedly designed to raise up an ideal queen of the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Ireland. But before we take a look at today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit brings you the stories that shaped the world through their award-winning podcast network and online history channel. It's like Netflix, but all history. With History Hit, you can watch hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones and more. In addition to already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. History Hit also launch 19 new episodes weekly across eight podcasts, which includes the world's leading history podcast, Dan Snow's History Hit. This week, I have really enjoyed checking out The Seven Deadly Sins with Eleanor Yanaga. I thought this discussion was absolutely fascinating. It was a great way to learn more about the history of these sins, how they have been presented, viewed and assessed, and what purposes they may have served. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, History Hit are offering my viewers a very special discount. If you use the code READINGTHEPAST30 at checkout, you will get 30% off an annual subscription. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. And now let's take a look at what it took to raise Queen Victoria. Princess Alexandrina Victoria was born at Kensington Palace on the 24th of May 1819. Now, for the majority of this video, I will be referring to the individual who history better remembers as Queen Victoria as either Alexandrina or the Princess. I will change this when she becomes Queen towards the end of the video, at which point I will begin calling her Queen Victoria after she ascends to the throne. I am deciding to do this as a way of making her distinct from her mother, who has a remarkably similar first name and is also at points called Princess. As I have previously discussed in my video on the death of Princess Charlotte, which occurred in 1817, and I will of course leave that particular video linked, this new baby's father, Edward Duke of Kent, responded to the death of his niece by setting aside his long-standing mistress so that he could marry Princess Victoire of saxe coburg sawfield He did so in the hope that he might be the one to furnish his dynasty with a replacement heir to the throne. Princess Victoire was the sister of both Leopold, widower of Princess Charlotte, and also of Ernest, Duke of saxe coburg sawfield whose younger son Albert would in the future become Alexandrina Victoria's husband. Interestingly, in addition to the family connection shared by these future spouses, namely that their parents were brother and sister, Albert and Alexandrina also shared something else, that they were delivered by the very same female obstetrician. Her name was Marion Theodore Charlotte Heidenrich von Siebold. I do think that one of the things that the House of Hanover is perhaps best known for is their capacity to fall out with each other. 
And of course, the birth of a brand new baby into the family could be no exception. Instead, it's clearly the ideal time to start a row. The Duke and Duchess of Kent had wanted to baptise their child using familial names. They had wanted Victoire, Georgiana, Alexandrina, Charlotte, Augusta. But the princess's uncle, who was at that time the Prince Regent and who would later become King George IV, had refused. He had a number of issues. First of all, there was the name order. Georgiana being linked to his own name, Alexandrina to the Tsar. Whoever comes first is going to insult who comes second. And so apparently problems could be caused regardless of which name came first. So best avoided. Augusta was apparently simply too much. And Charlotte, which was, of course, the name of George's recently deceased daughter, was simply too painful. Thus, Alexandrina Victoria was to be the compromise. Relations would deteriorate between the Prince Regent and the Duke of Kent over the coming months. By the end of 1819, when Princess Alexandrina Victoria was around seven months old, the Duke of Kent, with debt mounting, took his family away from London and the court and moved them to Devon. The next month, on the 23rd of January 1820, the Duke of Kent would die. According to his will, his daughter was to be left in the sole care and guardianship of her mother. The now dowager Duchess of Kent had, however, shared in her husband's family quarrels, and she had come to dislike and indeed distrust his brothers. The feeling was seemingly mutual. A few days later, on the 29th of January 1820, King George III died and thus the Prince Regent became King George IV. The household of this infant princess, who was now, by this point, fourth in line to the throne, was fairly strangely left to its own devices. I say strangely because this was a somewhat unconventional setup, as it was, indeed is, expected that a person who sits in such close proximity to the throne will have contact and connection with the royal court and indeed support from them. However, this estrangement was being pushed from both sides. The new king disliked his former sister-in-law and indeed wished for nothing more than that his 54-year-old brother William would manage to have a child with his 27-year-old wife Adelaide because any child of this marriage would displace little Alexandrina in the line of succession. The Dowager Duchess of Kent would turn to her brother Leopold for financial support and sometimes for advice, and she would also come to rely heavily on her husband's former equerry, John Conroy. For his part, Conroy would claim that he was simply obeying the wishes of his former master, the Duke, And that is why he was taking such an active role in the lives of that duke's widow and daughter. From this camp, the camp tasked with the physical care of Princess Alexandrina. That princess's paternal family appeared to have been viewed as, at best, a nest of bad influences and, at worst, a possible source of assassins. In 1825, Parliament recognised that the princess was likely to be the future queen and so they provided her with an annual grant. Meanwhile, her uncle the king would permit the Dowager Duchess and the princess to set up their residence in Kensington Palace. It was there that she would be raised and educated. The palace also, of course, provides the name for the system in which she would come to be raised. The Dowager Duchess, together with Sir John Conroy, sought to shape this princess's childhood her life, education, and thus, arguably, the woman and queen that she would become. Interestingly, her father's younger brothers, Ernest, Duke of Cumberland, and Adolphus, Duke of Cambridge, had also had children in 1819, which is the same year that Princess Alexandrina was born. These children were Prince George of Cumberland and Prince George of Cambridge. And give or take a few months, they were the same age as Princess Alexandrina. And I do think that in most families, this fact would have meant that these children would have been viewed as being natural companions for one another. But they were kept at arm's length in Kensington. And instead, 
a small group of hand-picked children would be the only ones who were permitted to act as this princess's playmates on occasion. Sir John Conroy's daughters would be regularly employed to fulfil this role, despite the fact that, according to reports, Alexandrina wasn't particularly keen on them. Indeed, the princess had no say in the hand-picking of any of her companions. The Dowager Duchess had, however, been married before, and she had been widowed, and from her first marriage she did have other children, so Alexandrina had siblings. There was Prince Carl, who was some 15 years older than his little sister, and Princess Theodore, who was nearly 12 years older. So neither were obvious playmates for Alexandrina. Carl would be away at school, and Theodore would leave England following her marriage in 1828, when her little sister was only around nine. A collection of dolls would fill Alexandrina's time, and with the help of the governess that she loved, Louise Letson, these dolls would be costumed in handmade clothes. These costumes would be similar to those that featured on the stages of the theatre of the day. They would also, in some cases, resemble the costumes of known historical figures. So in addition to being toys and souvenirs of the play and opera trips that this little girl loved, these were also potentially learning aids for this princess's education. Her other source of company, besides the fleet of servants, was her beloved dog, Dash. Matthew and Harrison, writing for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, explained that, quote, Letson, the daughter of a Lutheran pastor from Hanover, was among Victoria's most important formative influences. Setting herself in opposition to Conroy and the Duchess, whom she considered weak, Letson's ideal of a queen was Queen Elizabeth I, and she imbued in Victoria a sense of the importance of strength of will, elevating her natural obstinacy and stubbornness to a principle. Letson, who was the princess's constant preceptress until she came to the throne, would read to Victoria morning and evening, while she was being dressed or prepared for bed, thereby helping to instil the rigid work discipline which served Victoria well throughout her life. From April 1823, just before the princess turned four, her education was further supported by the frequent visit of her tutor, the Reverend George Davies. Under the guidance of Letson and Davies, the princess's education would cover reading, writing and arithmetic, but also religion, natural history, history, geography and poetry. And then for languages, there was the study of Latin, French, German and Italian. Other specialists would be brought in to teach her to sing, to play the piano and to dance, and also to sketch and to paint. When the princess was around 11, the Dowager Duchess was keen to prove to the public, the public that would one day become her daughter's subjects, that their future queen was being well-shaped and well-educated. And so she asked that the bishops of London and Lincoln would come to examine her, so they could assess her progress thus far. The results of this examination would be spoken of in glowing terms. I suppose that was always going to be the point, wasn't it? Distancing this princess from her dissolute uncles and extended family, individuals whose public reputation could scarcely have been worse, does seem to have been part of this concerted effort to win public admiration for the princess. Because this princess would be a different, more respectable monarch than any that the current brood could offer. The high quality of the education that she was receiving was also, as we've seen, being publicly reported. Thus, the Dowager Duchess and Sir John Conroy were, seemingly, looking to present this princess as something that was aspirational. Indeed, if this advertisement, issued in around 1900, is anything to go by, that aspiration was also something that was being instilled in the princess – and it was being instilled in such a way that it would become an enduring enough part of her narrative that it was still being referenced a year or so before she died. The advertisement is for Dr Williams Medicine Company's Pink Pills for Pale People, 
active against a variety of conditions, including anemia, rheumatism, neuralgia, tuberculosis, and hysteria. In the image, we are shown the young princess, and we have a report of what she was supposed to have said and done before her governess Letson once she learned where she sat in the line of succession. Quote, I see I am nearer the throne than I thought. Now, many a child would boast, but they don't know the difficulty. There is much splendour, but there is more responsibility. Further to this, Letson is supposed to have reported that the princess then gave her her hand, saying, quote, I will be good. From 1830, as the princess hurtled towards her teens, she began to chafe under the rigidity, expectation and control of the so-called Kensington system. In this year, her uncle Leopold's attention towards her was lessened because he had other responsibilities when he became king of the Belgians. There would also be a new king closer to home that year too. George IV's death on the 26th of June 1830 brought his brother William to the throne as King William IV. If he should die before his niece turned 18, then the Dowager Duchess would act as her regent, presumably with the ongoing help and advice of Sir John Conroy. Despite there being a new king, the apparent policy of keeping this princess away from her paternal family and from the royal court continued on. And now, as we've seen, on the one hand, this separation was certainly working to create a distance between the dissolute living of the House of Hanover and the character of the nation's next monarch. But on the other hand, it also ensured that this princess was limited in her sphere of influence and also potential support. Conroy and the Dowager Duchess would have to be enough. And if they were all she had access to before she ascended the throne might they also expect that they would retain their preeminence once she was queen. Additionally, as the Dowager Duchess only spoke limited English, that might mean that Conroy's power, if he played it right, could end up being unmatched. Despite their best efforts and attempts, scandal was never far away. Because the true nature of Conroy's relationship with the Dowager Duchess would become the focus of scurrilous rumours from 1829. These rumours were allegedly started by Ernest, Duke of Cumberland. Conroy felt that this was an attempt to paint the household as dissolute, something that would give an excuse for people to remove the princess. Conroy was apparently concerned that this plot may go further still and may in fact be an attempt to get hold of the princess so that she could be assassinated. I mean, after all, Cumberland was next in line to the throne after his niece. Also in 1830, which was the year that Leopold became King of the Belgians and William IV ascended to the throne, the princess was taken on her first tour or progress by her mother and Conroy. These would become regular occurrences. It seems that they viewed them as an opportunity for the people to see their future queen and for her to see them, and also for her to see more of the nation that she would eventually govern. On a visit to the black country, Alexandrina would record her shock to see that, quote, the country is very desolate, everywhere smoking and burning coal heaps, intermingled with wretched huts and carts and little ragged children. On these trips, she could be paraded. Her youth, education and many honourable qualities could be shown off as much as possible, and in doing so, she could become the figurehead for a hoped-for future. If the positive reception she received were anything to go by, then all of these plans, seemingly, were having their desired effect. They were, in quotes, a good thing. Except for the fact that these trips did displease King William. He saw them as a threat to his authority and his popularity. Additionally, they did also seem to take a toll on the princess as well. And I do think that's understandable. If we consider how sequestered away she had been in her day-to-day -day life thus far, it must have been quite a shock to go from that, that privacy and solitude, 
to effectively being on a royal progress with the press of people that those sorts of things entail. During the last of these tours, which took place in 1835, the princess was taken seriously ill with typhoid while visiting Ramsgate. For weeks, she was fighting to recover. She was confined to her bed. Conroy, with the support and apparent approval of the Dowager Duchess, her mother, used this as a moment to set about convincing, and by that read threatening, cajoling and bullying, this desperately sick young woman in the hopes that she would finally capitulate and sign a document to make him her private secretary when she became queen. Despite how ill and clearly exhausted she was, she refused. Later, she would tell Lord Melbourne, quote, I resisted in spite of my illness. Let's stick with the topic of spite, but turn instead to the example of King William IV, who, as if to spite his former sister-in-law and the man that he hated, John Conroy, King William IV survived just long enough for his niece to reach the age of 18 and thus have no need of a regent. In fact, he made it just over the line and then gave her a few weeks of grace, around a month. Princess Alexandrina ascended to the throne on the 20th of June, 1837. Almost at once, Sir John Conroy would find that he was no longer welcome in the now Queen Victoria's presence. And as for her mother, the Dowager Duchess, well, she was to be kept at arm's length for years, wheeled out only for ceremonial purposes. While Victoria would set up her residence at Buckingham Palace, her mother was sent to live in Belgrave Square, nearby, sure, but further than she had ever been before. Elizabeth Longford writes that, quote, as the Queen's mother, the Duchess found her trials increased. Victoria quitted her bedroom. Night fell on the Duchess for nearly three gloomy years. After the coronation, Queen Victoria kissed her aunt Queen Adelaide, but only shook her mother's hand. Only Letson remained. Until, that is, the Queen's future husband's dislike of her hit its zenith, at which point Letson was sent away. And this issued in somewhat of a change in fortune for Queen Victoria's mother. The Dowager Duchess would spend the next two decades at court, where she would be in the company of her daughter, son-in-law and their growing brood of children. When she died on the 16th of March 1861, Victoria was bereft and was apparently wrapped with guilt. So does that mean that she had forgiven her mother for the apparent torments of her upbringing? Or had she instead simply reframed the experience and or her mother's part in it? The keeping of a diary was something that had followed Victoria from her adolescence as a princess through much of her life as queen. And so much of the way that the Kensington system has been assessed has come from the way that it was reported on in these diaries. And perhaps that's fitting. I mean, after all, she had to live it, so surely she was the best placed person to describe it accurately, or at least accurately as she viewed it. So maybe it's true. Perhaps little Alexandrina was indeed a poor, friendless, fatherless girl who, through the connivance of a bad, wicked mother, had fallen into the hands of a, quote, monster and demon incarnate, meaning Conroy. Perhaps it's true that together these individuals constrained her within their system, and it would seem that Letson was her only ally in this, the true mother that she had wished that she'd had. At Kensington, Conroy and her mother kept her isolated, surveilled and infantilised. I mean, after all, before she was queen, this girl, young woman and then actual woman was not even permitted to descend the stairs without somebody holding her hand lest she should fall. Additionally, before she was queen, she was made to share a bedroom with her mother. She would seemingly not have a moment of privacy. Was it really the case that her uncle, King William IV, was her only truly powerful supporter? A caring but distant figure who would seek, unsuccessful as it would turn out, 
to free her from the clutches of Conroy and her mother. I mean, after all, Victoria had been invited to attend William's coronation, but her mother refused, and this did cause offence. Then, when Alexandrina was being confirmed in the Chapel Royal in St James's Palace on the 30th of July 1834, King William demanded that John Conroy leave the service. Then, when the princess and her mother did accept an invitation, this one to join the king for dinner in August 1836, he took the opportunity in front of both of them and the other assembled guests to announce that it was his firm wish that he should live until his niece reached the age of 18, which, as we know, he did do. He went on to explain that in doing so, quote, I should then have the satisfaction of leaving the royal authority to the personal exercise of that young lady, and not in the hands of a person now near me, who is surrounded by evil advisers, and who is herself incompetent to act with propriety in the station in which she would be placed. Furthermore, as soon as she turned 18, King William would offer his niece the opportunity to set up her own household, one that was away from her mother and Conroy. He would offer her an income of her own with which to do so. But the Dowager Duchess did make her daughter refuse the offer. She dictated the letter that she must send. Did William recognise the torment of his niece and seek to alleviate it? Victoria does seem to have considered her childhood to have been melancholic, even miserable. However, there is evidence that her mother did love her deeply, and that despite the recorded restrictions of the Kensington system, the little girl did get to go on lovely trips to the coast and to the theatre to watch plays and operas, both of which she would enjoy very much. Perhaps even that most wicked Conroy wasn't simply motivated to feather his own nest. Is it possible that his demonstrated need for control, which, don't get me wrong, was pretty unnerving, was in fact about trying to keep a little girl on track to be queen? Was he desperately looking for ways to ensure that she would remain popular, moral and also alive? by any means necessary, even if those means made her utterly despise him. Knowing what we know today, and let's be clear, we are still very much at the beginning of our understanding of the mind and its workings, but from what we do know, what we have gleaned thus far about child development, and indeed the social needs of many people, I think it's fair to say that the Kensington system is not one that we would be likely to recommend for emulation. Of course, we must remember that the studies and reports that contain the information that we now have access to, and the advice, were simply not available to those who were involved with raising Alexandrina to become Victoria. We should also, I think, remember that no one from history thought they were the bad guy, just like no one today thinks they are the bad guy. Everyone, no matter how depraved the thing they are doing or have done, everyone thinks they're doing the right thing, one way or another. Which perhaps we should remember as we look to assess the Kensington system and the people who designed and upheld it, maybe. Additionally, if we take a quick peruse of some child rearing advice from the period in which the Kensington system was flourishing, well, some of that advice suggests that parents and people involved with raising children do some things that are, well, frankly illegal in lots of places. I'm also going to suggest that it's my suspicion that none of us are raising a future monarch. And if I am wrong on that, well, welcome to the channel. Leave a crown and baby emoji in the chat. I don't know. I'm assuming that nobody is. So perhaps we need to consider that for people who are doing that and for people who did do that, different rules apply, both then and now. Additionally, as someone who is currently doing my impression of parenting, I am by no means arrogant enough to believe that this cycle is not in some way going to continue with my own son if he should one day have children of his own. 
because the knowledge will have expanded, the advice will have changed, and I have no doubt that he will look back on the way that he is currently being raised and view it as something that is unpardonably old-fashioned. In fact, I am already thinking of ways to apologise. So with all of that in mind, should we maybe go easy on the princess's mother and even on Sir John Conroy? Is it possible that we should even consider celebrating them? Well, what do you think of the childhood and education of Queen Victoria, of the so-called Kensington system? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video, or you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful, and if you did, please do think about sharing with your friends. Also, if you like my channel, please share that with your friends too. Let me know you like this video by hitting the thumbs up, and also please subscribe to the channel. If you think you're subscribed, I have seen lots of people commenting that they thought they were, and then they checked and they were unsubscribed. So now is a perfect time for you to have a little check. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, when you do so, you will notice there's a bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button. Please do hit that bell icon and then a drop down will appear select all in the drop down and then allegedly YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope. I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.